Hi there, Lexi Rodrigo here. A few days ago, you sent me your most burning questions about how to create and how to sell your online courses. And I passed them along to an expert, Danny Innie. Danny is the founder and CEO of Miracy. He's the author of the best-selling book, Teach and Grow Rich, and he is the creator of the Course Builders Laboratory. So here are the questions you asked, and here are Danny's answers. All right, question one is there, there is strong encouragement to validate a business idea before and or while building an audience. Any suggestions for facilitating that with an online audience who aren't your friends or peers? Um, it's a great question. It's really important to validate that you're on track building something people actually want. Um, and you want to make sure you're going after the kind of people who are ultimately going to be your prospects and your customers, so not friends and family. So sometimes there's an overlap. Sometimes there are people you know that you're connected to that are within the target audience you want to reach. But what I would start doing is look at where do the people you want to reach hang out and do some high-touch networking. So reach out, connect with people individually, look who's commenting on blogs, look who's engaging in Facebook groups, forums, communities, and don't just like post content and hope they're going to get a, like you know want to connect. Find them, email them, message them, build a relationship, build a connection. Um, definitely do that quickly and kind of make that your source of feedback. Next question. I need your help on mainly three aspects. One, the challenge to include the right amount of relevant, easy, enjoyable content. That is um, two, on target for my market, while I three, begin to use different technologies, etc. I'm not sure I understand this question, but it, I, I think I think the question here is um, just about kind of getting started doing enough of the right stuff without it taking all the time and energy that you then have nothing left to do other things. And this all comes down to an understanding of your audience, of your customer, of your student, and asking yourself, you know, often we think, what is all the stuff I can do for them? What is the most I can do for them? You actually want to ask the opposite question. You want to ask, what is the least that I can do for them? and still make them happy and still create a valuable outcome. And doing that allows you to shrink the scope of what you're doing while still creating a meaningful impact, which frees up more time for all the other stuff. How long is too long for a course? Is there a time limit where people lose focus? How long is too long for a course? Well, it's, it's kind of a how long is a piece of string question. It really depends on the subject matter and the content. Um, but what I will say is that most courses are longer than they need to be. The question you really want to ask yourself is, is everything in your course absolutely critical for people to be successful with the subject matter, to get the understanding and the outcomes that they want? Um, because everything is either critical or detrimental. If it's not absolutely necessary, it's an opportunity for your students to become distracted, confused, and overwhelmed. So trim down, trim down, trim down, as long as you're still delivering the outcome that people care about. For your first course, is it better to start with a broad topic than niche it down with other courses from there, or just start with a narrow focused course? Um, people often ask, should I start broad or should I start narrow and focused? The answer is almost always start focused. And maybe stay focused, maybe move on to different specific focuses, but broad and vague usually doesn't work. There's always the exception that kind of proves the rule that you'll find and people will point to it and say, oh, look, well, they did it. But you know, they did it in spite of that, not because of it. So stay narrow, stay focused, and uh, you're going to do a whole lot better that way. Next, is there a course format that converts better than others? Video, email, does the popularity of format change based on the audience? Um, what your course should look like, should it be video, text, audio, etc., depends on a few factors. It depends on who is your audience right, who is the market, what is going to be valuable for them, and what do they enjoy and appreciate. It depends on your subject matter. You know, some things call for, for example, some things are very visual. Um, teaching people a martial arts move is very hard to do through audio. <laughs> you need to show, you need to, to demonstrate. Um, and a lot of it comes down to you and your strengths as a teacher. If you're great in writing, but you're not strong on video, I would focus on writing and minimize video. It's not to say you don't do any. Right? You want to ultimately do what's best for your students and for your audience. And you do want to push out of your comfort zone a little, but you want to operate within the bounds of your strength. How do you determine the right price? Does price differ if the same course is marketed to parents versus business owners? Like if you were doing a course on goal setting or a self-help topic, would you brand it one way and charge a set amount for parents, then brand it a different way and charge a different amount for business owners? Um, I saw a guy do this several years ago. I can't remember now who it was, but I only caught it because they used the exact same screenshots on both sites. 
Um, the question of how to set the price for your course is a big one. It's a question that a lot of people have. And what you're going to do is triangulate based on three different things. The first thing you're triangulating on is the transformation. What is the outcome you're promising? And of course, this relates to your target customer, right? Different target customers value the transformation in different ways. So it's really about what is it worth to your target customer. Second, you want to look at the competition. If they're not going to take your course, how are they going to get this problem solved? Will they take somebody else's course? Will they hire a service provider? Will they, um, who, I don't know what they will do. What are the other things they'll explore? What is the competition? And then finally, you want to look at how you are positioned against relative to that competition. Are you better? Are you easier? Are you faster? Are you more accessible? Do you provide more support? And use these three factors to triangulate the price of your course. Next question. Each of the product vendors, course platform, payment processor, email service provider, et cetera, do okay on their own products, but trying to get four products to mesh nicely and actually showing you how to do it could be a lucrative course all on its own. Any tips? Um, you know, a lot of people struggle with all the technologies that they have to integrate in order to make their online courses work. You've got to accept payments. You've got to um, you've got to, to work together your different technologies. You've got to do email marketing. You've got to deliver the content of the course. Um, what I always recommend to people is go as simple as you can. Don't go for all the bells and whistles until you're at a stage where you need it and can really afford it. Start simple, deploy, get results for your students. Um, it, it's always better that way. Now that said, if you need a, a platform that does more rather than less, one of the platforms that we recommend is Teachable. We actually have a partnership with Teachable where every student in our course builders laboratory gets a year of access to their pro plan that would otherwise cost about $1,000. Next question. I've created a couple of courses and I've been marketing them, but the results are not what I'd like them to be. I feel like I've burned through my list. What can I do to get new students? Um, a lot of people struggle with the marketing of their course. They come to me and they say, I've built my course. It's a good course, but I'm having trouble selling it. And um, my feedback is usually that it might not be as good a course as you think. Good does not mean that people love it. Good does not mean that, that you think it's amazing. Good means that it aligns really well with what people want and then delivers on that outcome. So just delivering an outcome is not enough. It's got to align with what people want. That's the key. If your conversions are good, if what you have is exactly what people want when you present it to them, you can always afford to get more traffic. Right? You can pay for it with ads, you can pay for it indirectly with commissions to join, to join venture partners, or you can pay for it very indirectly by doing the stuff that is quote unquote free, like content marketing or hiring someone else to do those things. So whenever someone comes to me and says, you know, my course is great, but it's not selling, um, how can I get more customers? How can I get more leads? You know, we can talk about different strategies for getting in front of more people, but 99% of the time, that's not really the problem. The problem is that the course is not converting the way they want it to. And sometimes that means taking a step or two back and, and fixing it. You've got to get it right first. Next question. Will people really pay for my online course when there are so many free resources online? A lot of people are worried about competition. They're worried about the fact that they're entering a crowded market. There are a lot of competitors. And in many of those landscapes, a lot of the content out there is free. A lot of the stuff they're competing with doesn't cost anything. And they're thinking, well, how can I compete? And here's what I always say. First of all, I love saturated markets. Saturated markets are great because it tells me that there's a lot of demand for what you're offering. Now that said, in a saturated market, the audience, the customers are more sophisticated and you have to stand out. You have to differentiate in a meaningful way. And so here's what I would do. I would look at the landscape and I would say, what is missing? What is not being provided? If you can point to a competitor and say, they do an amazing job. They provide all of the outcomes people want. Nobody has any trouble. Um, and the price is totally reasonable and fair, then, then don't create a course because there's a great solution already you can point to. But if you look at the landscape and you say, there is something that I think should be taught but isn't, or it is taught but not in the way I think it should be taught, or it's, it's being provided but it's not being supported. If there's a reason why people are not getting the outcomes that they want and you feel like you can fix it, that is how you compete and that is how you stand out because people ultimately want the outcomes. And if you can offer them and others can't, then you're in great shape. I've been offering online fitness courses for women and ju doing just okay. Nothing great could be better. How can I take it to the next level? I can't seem to charge more than $100. Some course creators sometimes find that they've hit a plateau. They've created a course. It's kind of selling. It's kind of doing okay, but they can't get over a certain volume. They can't get over a certain price. And what I would do is, is take a few steps back and revisit 
who is the customer? Is this the best customer? Is their need as great as it could be? What is the transformation? Is it as powerful as it could be? Is it as compelling to this customer? Or do you need a different customer who would appreciate it more? And then make sure you re-engineer everything you're doing to really deliver the outcomes that will be compelling enough to justify more engagement, more growth, et cetera. Um, I'll share an anecdote. Um, we had a podcast a couple of years ago called Connect, Engage, Inspire, and it ran for a long time. We had about 100 and something episodes. And it always hovered around like the, the 100th most popular podcast on iTunes in business, which sounds really great, but it, you know, it kind of falls a power law distribution. So it, it, it doesn't actually mean that much. We had maybe 10,000 people listening every month. And I, I was asking myself, you know, what, what can we do to get into the top 10? And I stopped and I really thought about it. I was like, you know what? I don't think it deserves to be in the top 10. It's just not that good. You know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, you know, I get interesting people on app, ask them interesting questions, but it was kind of a generic online business podcast. And so we shut it down. We started a new, pat, a new podcast called Business Reimagined, which is 10 times better. And it's doing a whole lot better. It, it got better results with its 10th episode than we had with the previous podcast on its 100th right? Much better trajectory because we fixed the content, we fixed the product, we made it into something really great. Often when people think they have a marketing problem, there's usually a product problem. Um, what's the best way to make sure my online course is as effective or even more effective than a live person-to-person -person class or training? How can I make sure my students are really learning even when I'm not physically in the same room with them? A lot of people are concerned about creating an online course that is going to be truly transformative. And they're worried that it's never going to be as good as if they were delivering that in person. And here's the thing, you're kind of, that's kind of a, a valid concern, but only if you approach it from a certain way. If you say that the way education, quote unquote, should be done is live and in person, and an online course is always going to be an approximation of that. It's like live and in person, only not as good. It's always going to be a poor man's version of, of a better experience. The thing is, there's a lot about live in-person training that is not optimal. You have to go at the same pace as everyone else. You have to show up at a time that's not convenient for you because of logistics and scheduling. Um, the length of a lesson is, is got to be a certain length rather than being what's best for the content. Um, I wrote about this quite a lot in my book, Teach and Grow Rich. But if you start from scratch and you think about what is the very best experience that I can create for people, how can I facilitate the best transformation given what is possible in an online distance learning context, you can actually create an even better experience. And that's exactly what we teach people how to do inside the Course Builders Laboratory. Now we've got three similar questions. What's the best online teaching or virtual classroom you recommend for people who are new to this? What's the best platform for online courses? And what LMS do we recommend? I already, I already answered the question where I talked about uh, Teachable. So um, I think that covers it. Awesome. Thank you very much for sending your questions and for watching this video. And if you have any more questions about course building, remember to check out the link somewhere around this video. Bye.